<clears throat> All right, this is the second part of chapter seven. Perhaps the project dearest to Teddy's heart was the idea of joining the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans by a canal across the 50-mile-wide Isthmus of Panama. As a world power, the United States needed a quick route from one ocean to the other so it could establish its place on both sides of the world. A shortcut across the Isthmus was not a new idea. In the 16th century, the Spanish had seen the need and built a road. A private French company had only recently tried to build a canal but had gone bankrupt. In the 1850s, a group of American businessmen had built a railroad across the Isthmus. Teddy was a Navy man, and he wanted a three-way for ships. In June 1902, after weeks of debate, Congress passed the Spooner Bill, authorizing the construction of, America, of an American canal in Panama. But what about the people in Panama? Did they want a canal? They loved the idea, but Panama was a colony of its neighbor, Colombia, which would have to make the decision. So in 1903, the United States worked out a treaty with the Colombian, gov Colombian government, and when the United States Senate ratified the treaty, Teddy, like everyone else, thought it was settled. But the Colombian senator, I'm sorry, but the Colombian Senate refused to sign, claiming that the Americans were taking advantage of them. This is when Teddy Roosevelt's advent, sorry, this is when, this was when Teddy Roosevelt's patience began to wear thin. In private letters to John Hay, his se Secretary of State, who was trying to negotiate the deal, Teddy referred to the Colombians as contemptible little creatures, jackrabbits, inefficient bandits. The people in Panama were also angry. They wanted the canal. Teddy let it be known that he would be delighted if Panama were an independent state. Panamanians had come to the state to the same conclusion, and on November 3rd, 1903, they began a revolution. It was a short it was short and successful with one American gunboat anchored in the harbor, another on its way, and with the Panamanian Railroad under orders from the United States not to transport Colombian troops on November 6th. Panama declared its independence and the United States recognized the Republic of Panama. Perhaps nothing President Roosevelt did in office aroused as much criticism as this use of what some called gunboat diplomacy. Teddy was accused of land piracy, of stirring up a revolution, but he said he hadn't stirred up anything. He had simply lifted his foot and let it happen. This was one way of putting it, but without those gunboats and without American cooperation, it is doubtful that Panama would have won its independence as easily. Americans who had always been uneasy about Teddy's hand being on the lever became even more uneasy. What would he do next? Mark Twain was one of those who worried. I think he longs for a big war, he said. But as far as Teddy was concerned, he had just cut through red tape so he could get the, the canal started. And indeed, within six months, it was started. Running beneath all Teddy's other interests in this ter term of office, however, was his overwhelming ambition to be elected to the presidency in 1904. Now he was simply president in the place of McKinley, an accidental president, he called himself. He wanted to be president in his own right. I'd rather be elected to that office, he said, than have anything. I know, but I shall never be elected. They don't want it. He meant that the Republican bosses, Mark Hanna, Senator Platt, and the rest didn't want it. They sided with Ben from big business in forming a strong conservative force in the Republican Party, fighting for the right to be free and make as much money as they could, whether it harmed people or not. So as the election approached, Teddy did his best to win these men over, reassuring them, consulting with them, even inviting J.P. Morgan to the White House. But Teddy need not have worried. He was more popular with the American people public than he supposed. At the Republican National Convention in June 1904, he was unanimously chosen as the presidential candidate. On November 8th, he was elected president in his own right by a greater popula popular majority than any recorded up to that time. Theodore Roosevelt's inauguration day, March 4th, 1905, must have ranked, along with his day at San Juan Hill, as one of the happiest in his life. On the night before the inauguration, Secretary of State John Hay, who had once been Abraham Lincoln's private secretary, gave him a ring containing a lock of Lincoln's hair. Please wear it tomorrow, Hay wrote. You are one of the men who most thoroughly understands and appreciates Lincoln. With this ring on his finger, Theodore Roosevelt took his oath of office on the porch of the Capitol, his shoulders back, his voice ringing out against a strong wind, as if he were directing his promise to every man, woman, and child in the country, as well as to the powers above. Teddy threw himself wholeheartedly into the inaugural festivities. In the afternoon, he took his place in the front of the reviewing stand, saluting and cheering as the Grand Parade marched by. Governors, Army and Navy cadets, state organizations, Native Americans, Harvard men, and more. There was one group Teddy was particularly eager to see, the Rough Riders. They had served as his honor guard at the inauguration ceremony, and when they came down the road, they were riding at full gallop, swirling their lassos, waving their hats. A band played, there will be a hot time in the old town tonight, and for a few moments, President Roosevelt became Colonel Roosevelt again, his face aglow, his body swaying, his arms swinging in time to music. Teddy was 46 years old. He had gained 40 pounds during his term in office. He weighed 225 pounds now. 
which showed that he had kept busy not only at his desk and on the tennis courts, but at the dinner table as well. Now as he went back to work, he tried to extend his reforms and propose new ones, including a few that were rather strange. Once in a burst of morality, Teddy, a, form, a firm believer in family life, suggested that marriage and divorce should be regulated by the federal government, perhaps even by an amendment to the Constitution. On another occasion, he introduced the idea of adopting a simplified spelling system. About 300 words should, would be changed. T-H-R-U for through, for instance. T-H-O-R-O-L-Y for thoroughly. D-R-O-P-T for dropped. These ideas didn't get far, nor did his suggestion that the motto, In God We Trust, be dropped from coins. He thought it was blasphemous to put God on money. Sometimes it was hard to tell what Teddy would do next, but in August 1905, he must have surprised Mark Twain and the others, who accused him of having warlike disposition. At the moment, a war was being waged in the Far East, but Teddy didn't try to enter it, nor did he support it. Instead, he stopped it. For more than a year, Russia had been fighting Japan in Manchuria, and Roosevelt did not think it was in America's interest for either of these nations to become too strong in the Pacific. So, in the hope of helping the countries reach a settlement, he invited their representatives to come to, come to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, for a peace, off, peace conference. When they all came together, Teddy found that making peace was almost harder than making war. He had to be polite and sympathetic and patient with both Japanese and the Russians, he said, when all the time he wanted to jump up and knock their heads together. His patience paid off, however. A compromise was reached, and a peace treaty was signed on, on September 5, 1905. In appreciation for his services in giving peace to the world, President Roosevelt was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, Prize for Peace. Two years later, in another grand show of peace, Teddy had the American fleet painted white and sent around the world on a tour of friendship. This would show the world he figured not only how peaceful America was, but how strong it was. Some Americans predicted that this display of power would bring on war, but as it turned out, the tour was a success and Roosevelt was again hailed as a peacemaker. In addition, Teddy Roosevelt continued to work as he always had for conser conservation. As a leader of the Boone and Crockett Club, he had worked to save forest and wildlife. As governor of New York, he had come out against the polluting of Adirondack streams that had pushed for laws and had pushed for laws to protect birds, especially songbirds, from being destroyed just so hatmakers could have pretty feathers to decorate ladies' hats. When he finally became president in his own right, he said, watch out for me. He had many kinds of changes in mind for, the, for America, but nothing was more important to him than a change of the way Americans use their land and their natural resources. Unless they began to think more of the public good and less of private gain, there would be little left for future generations to enjoy. At every opportunity, he tried to educate the public to the dangers of waste and pollution, and it is no wonder that he became known as the conservation president. During this time in the White House, he established 150 national forests, the first 55 bird and game preserves, and five national parks. Under the National Monuments Act, he set aside the first 18 national monuments, including Devil's Tower in Wyoming, the Grand Canyon, California's Mirror Woods, Arizona's Petrified Forest, and Washington's Mount Olympus. Indeed, Theodore Roosevelt deserves much of the credit for teaching Americans to respect what nature has given them. When the National Wildlife Federation established a Conservation Hall of Fame in 1965, Theodore Roosevelt was given first place. John Muir came in second, John James Audubon fifth, and Henry David Thoreau sixth. If Roosevelt was praised for some of his actions, he was, like all presidents, blamed for things he couldn't help. When the country ran into hard times and people lost money, he was blamed. George Washington had the same problem. A friend pointed out he complained that he was held responsible even for the weather. Teddy didn't complain, but his face showed the strain of his years in office. Still being president was fun, he insisted. No president, he said, has ever enjoyed himself as much as I have enjoyed myself. But it would soon be over. At the time of his election, he had, started public, he had stated publicly that he would not run for another term. Like George Washington, he did not believe it was wise to have the same man as president three times at a stretch. Yet here he was, not quite 50 years old, passing the crest of his career, and already he had fulfilled all his boyhood dreams. Ready or not, he had to take his hand off the lever. It was hard for Teddy to let go, and it was hard for Americans to let him go. At the Republican National Convention of in 1908, such a wild clamor broke out for Teddy that it almost seemed the people would make him president again, whether he agreed or not. Delegates and visitors alike stood on chairs shouted, waved teddy bears, took off their coats, and swung them around their heads. For 50 minutes, they kept this up, and no matter how hard the chairman rapped for order, it made no difference. When the time came for nominations to be made, Teddy Roosevelt had to telephone the convention from the White House, stating again that he would not be a candidate. Whether people agreed with all Roosevelt's policies or not, most could not help loving him. There was such warmth to the man, such life, and even pe that even people who didn't know him felt he was their friend. Farmers living near railroad, railroad tracks would light up their houses when they heard that Teddy would be riding by. In the middle of the night, they would step out on their porches and wave at the train. They knew that Teddy wouldn't see them, but they wanted to salute him anyway. Everyone recognized that Theodore Roosevelt was like no one else. A visiting Englishman put it this way, America had two natural wonders, Niagara Falls and Theodore Roosevelt. 
A Chicago newspaperman wrote an article in praise of Teddy, addressing him directly. All the fun of you and the glory of you. Where lies the American whose passion or whose imagination, imagination you have not set a tingling? Before you came, all in politics was set and regular. Those who were ordained to rule over us did so with that gravity with which stupid grown-ups so often repress the child. No one ever talked to us as you did. They never took us by the hand and laughed and played with us as you did. And then you came. Dancing down the road, you came with life and love and courage and fun sticking out all over you. How we loved you at first sight and how you loved us. Teddy's final days at the White House were busy with farewells as preparations were busy with farewells as well as preparations for his next step. Of course, he wanted his policies to be carried forward in the next administration. So he had he had handpicked the Republican he hoped would win the election. His good friend, William Howard Taft, was his choice. And to Teddy's great satisfaction, he was elected. Now it was a matter of goodbyes. Teddy gave a number of White House dinners for dignitaries and friends, and in turn, he was flooded with farewell letters. Between 15 and 20,000 arrived in his last week alone. What now? Teddy had no intention of retiring full-time to his rocking chair. Adventure, that's what he wanted. He and Kermit, under the sponsorship of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., were going to Africa to hunt. Lion, rhinoceros, hippopotamus, anything Africa offered. Corinne asked her brother what kind of presents she could give him for the trip. Teddy didn't hesitate. A pigskin library, he said. Theodore Roosevelt couldn't go anywhere without a supply of books to read, but in Africa, ordinary book bindings would fall apart, so he asked Corinne to have the book specially bound in pigskin. He gave her a list of 60 books, which she had bound and which indeed accompanied him on the back, burrows, or the, on the back of Burroughs through the jungles. Taft was duly inaugurated as president, and Teddy set sail, waving to the vast crowd that had come to see him off, waving and waving until the United States gradually faded from sight. Then it was hurrah, full steam ahead for the lions.